thank you so much for having us, Anuel. Um, I am here with some incredible people. We have Angeliki, Stephen, and Prince. And I just want to say thank you all so much for your vulnerability and your transparency and you being willing and wanting to have this conversation about what it's like to be a young person that gets diagnosed with cancer and, and fight it. And then, of course, some of the things that happen that we don't always think about um, after that diagnosis or as you grow up a little bit. So first, Prince, my man, you're in London. Yeah. <laughs> here with you. I got a question for you. So you were the youngest person out of the group here to be diagnosed with cancer. You were only 14, right? Yes. Yeah, 14. What's that like, man? What's that like? What goes through the mind of a 14-year-old? Um, you know, you're, you're, you're becoming an adult. You have such different needs and wants and desires at 14 years old, and then you get diagnosed with cancer. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think um, for me in particular, I was very blindsided, um, so in my family, because uh, um, I was very sort of active. Um, it was a lot of confusion um, to begin with, um, a lot of fear um, as well. Um, but essentially, I think um, discovering what the actual illness was um, obviously gave some, some kind of closure and gratitude and at least gave a purpose as to what the goal was and what the, 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 um, the struggle was to overcome, really. What's it like interacting with other people your age when you're going through and battling cancer? Because I know that, look, man, when you're, you know, as a 14-year-old boy, I just wanted to be accepted by the other kids, right? I just wanted to be liked and have friends and, you know, go to parties and hang out. But I feel like when you're 14, that probably makes you grow up a lot faster. Absolutely. I think it was, uh, I think that was probably one of the hardest um, parts, um, especially in the beginning um, stages. You're completely, I wouldn't say ostracized, but separated from um, a group that you essentially grew up with. And that in itself um, was a huge, huge, um, <clears throat> a huge weight to, to, to bear, really. Um, now, coming across individuals like myself, um, coming across individuals that were going through what I was going through, essentially allowed me to, to, to be able to really open up and actually um, speak of, of, of the struggles I was going through. Thank you, Prince. I'm gonna go to you, Angeliki. You were 19, right? Yes. When you were diagnosed? Mm -hmm. So kind of piggybacking off of what Prince was saying, you know, you're in the, you're getting cancer treatment in hospitals. I'm sure it can feel like at times you're just constantly surrounded by doctors and nurses and people that are not your age. So how important is it for a young person, maybe at 19, to be also surrounded by people that are your age? Yeah, I think it's really important. I was diagnosed in college, so my whole world was, you know, surrounded by friends all day, every day. And then mm -hmm leaving to go to the hospital, um, like Prince said, it was hard for friends and family to like fully understand everything that I was going through and not mm -hmm. because I didn't try, it just like wasn't something they had personal experience with. So then meeting other young adults with cancer, you know, you just like connected instantly over a lot of those shared experiences. Um, so really important to meet other people who could understand on that level. I can imagine it's, it's lonely. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, you know, I know having made a lot of um, documentaries and having so many friends who are living and who have passed from cancer, I know one of the common threads has been like how hard it is to just feel normal. Um, because like Prince said, like, you know, people are scared of their mortality, so they don't want to talk about it and they don't know how to talk about it with you. Yeah, it was definitely like an isolating kind of time. It, like all the friends I had from school felt like they were moving forward and moving on and continuing. And then I was just like pulled out of that and just kind mm -hmm. of stuck in like not moving anywhere. But then meeting other young adult cancer patients kind of like brought back that sense of normalcy because what was normal for me was also normal for them. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Steven, I want to ask you, um, how important is it for, uh, for family and friends 
to show up for someone who is going through cancer emotionally. And, and I also don't feel like there's like a rule book, you know, there's, there's not like a manual that, you know, they can give a family or a brother or a sister or a father, you know, when someone in the family is diagnosed with cancer. So I would say the first thing is simply just show up. And even if you don't know what to say, that's totally fine. We don't know what to do or say either as someone who's been diagnosed with cancer, we're dealing with it every day as it comes to. So if someone shows up and says, I don't know what to say to you, it's like, yeah, that's totally valid. But at least you're here and you're hanging out with me and watching movies and talking about serious stuff or fun stuff, whatever it is. I want to take it a step deeper now, Stephen. And inevitably when you're going through cancer treatment um, and you're in the hospital and you're getting chemo or you're recovering from surgeries or whatever you go through, um, you'll make friends and meet people in that hospital that might not be as fortunate as you and um, will pass away. What can friends or family do or say to help a cancer patient cope with the loss of a friend or, a, or, or someone that they've, that they've seen going through treatment in the hospital? Because that's not something that we often think about and I don't think people prepare for. Yeah, I think, especially as a, when you're a young person, you have this kind of linear idea of what life is going to be like. It's, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to go get a job, I'm going to get married, have kids, and I'm not going to have to worry about my friends passing until I'm at least middle age or older than that. And yeah. the experience definitely speeds things up. It kind of ages you in a weird way sometimes. Because you're dealing with losing friends in your 20s and 30s, and you didn't expect to have to do that when you're a kid. You didn't know that was a thing you'd have to confront so early in life. Mm. It's almost like you're grieving your own life and your dreams for it and what you wish you were doing with that time and also simultaneously experiencing grief because people around you are dying. Yeah. That's a lot. You're grieving a lot of old ideas of what life is supposed to be like. Prince, I want to jump to you because I know you've had to deal with quite a few losses um, since you were 14. H how did you deal with that? And, and, and did anyone at the hospital prepare you for it um, emotionally? It's, I don't think it's something even they're prepared for because uh, a lot of the staff themselves get really invested in the well-being of the, of the kids themselves especially on the Teenage Cancer Trust units anyway. And uh, essentially, none of us are ever really prepared to, to, to deal with, you know, losing, losing anyone that we get to know. So <clears throat> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a really tricky, it's, a, it's a really tricky answer. But I wouldn't say um, I dealt with it in one particular way or one particular way was more effective um, than the other. Um, what I can say was, uh, what I can say is, um, it's, it's really important to remember these guys because, because of the impact they had on me personally. Um, and, and I've done everything I possibly can um, um, to make sure that they are remembered, you know? And Angelica, you've, you've, uh, you've written quite a bit about the complexities of what it's like to lose people that you care about going through this. Um, I think I... Survivor's guilt was a big part of survivorship, and I think survivorship as a whole is kind of overlooked in terms of the cancer timeline. And so I was asking questions like, why did my treatment work and my friends didn't? And why am I alive and my friends aren't? Like, why did I lose my friends at such a young age? That kind of stuff. And, you know, didn't I, those questions don't really have answers. Um, so I tried to kind of reframe what felt like survivor's guilt into a survivor's responsibility kind of thing. So, hmm. you know, if they weren't here to keep, you know, if they're not here and I am, then it becomes kind of my role to contribute to the world in some of the ways they would have and apply the lessons they taught me. And, you know, I don't think there's a universal way to work through grief or anything like that, but hmm. it was something that helps me and, gives me comfort and you know when I lost them it felt that I had lost my purpose in some ways like my role as their friend and 
in, in like thinking about things as a survivor's responsibility, it kind of brought back that purpose and that role as a friend. And, you know, it's just like my way of keeping their memory alive. Thank you. And Stephen, I want to jump to you, man. Um, it's been said uh, that it could be better for patients um, if they didn't engage with each other and get to know each other in hospitals, um, because it would, um, it would uncomplicate things. I'm just curious what your feedback is on that. I just think that's kind of short-sighted mostly because I just myself, when I was first given any kind of resources for young adult cancer communities, I wasn't ready yet, but in retrospect, I wish I had joined them earlier because I was kind of flailing and searching for help and support. And I, even in the best case scenario, if you have a really good support system, great immediate family, some cool friends, that's really good. But I think beyond that, you need people that really understand what you're going through. I, I used to say when I first went through chemo, I felt like I was a, an astronaut who got to go to the moon which was this crazy life experience. And it gave me this new perspective on my own life and the world at large. But also the problem with being an astronaut who got to go to the moon is there's only like a dozen of those guys that know what that experience is like. So if they don't talk to each other, they probably just sound like crazy people. And that's how I started to feel with even close friends and family members. Um, so what do you think that, what do you think that um, doctors and nurses can do specifically to help these, um, these young people deal with loss and prepare them for instead of extrapolating them from the situation and, and, um, and, and preventing them from seeing each other? I think the main thing is they're so focused usually on the patient and just getting them through cancer. So they don't want to add any more burdens or any more anxiety to the patient. Yeah. I think, and I know a lot of communities are more underserved than others. But I think it's important for these hospitals to have some kind of program, some kind of survivorship program, some kind of young adult cancer program where they do have a social worker that comes in and says, hey, there's this, you know, there's Teen Cancer America, there's Stupid Cancer. They can give you a list of organizations um, where you can reach out to people. And Prince, man, because um, we're about to wrap up, I just want to know, what would you tell someone who's in high school or college, who has a friend or even an acquaintance that has cancer, but maybe doesn't know what to say to that, that person. So whatever they feel <clears throat> they're feeling, whoever's going through the process is probably feeling it a hundred times more. That fear they feel, that anxiety they feel, that um, just being unsure, that is something that we're experiencing or the, 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 the patient is going through a hundred times more. So essentially like what's been said before, just be there, just be there, be an ear, be a presence, be a hug, be a friend. And that's literally all that's needed. Um, I have a good friend that funny enough, I actually met um, on one of the, uh, <clears throat> one of the um, um, events that Teenage Cancer Trust UK holds. Now, his name is Raphael Pierre. He's actually older than me, but he had cancer when he was younger, and I met him when he was in remission. Now, I relapsed at 17 and a half. Um, I met him at about 15, and I relapsed at 17 and a half. And uh, this guy actually slept in my hospital ward for six months straight. He'd go to work come back, sleep over. He was just there. So essentially, you just have to be present. Mm. Bro, that made me tear up. That gives me hope. You know, that's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Prince. And uh, Angeliki, you've, you've talked about turning survivor res uh, guilt into survivor responsibility. Can you just close out with what you mean by that? Yeah, so... That was a little of what I was talking about earlier um, in terms of, you know, finding ways to keep their memory alive. So whether that's, you know, doing things that they would have loved or, yeah. you know, applying some of the lessons they taught me in terms of, you know, being thankful and, you know, giving to others and, you know, showing up for others, even if you're in a difficult time yourself and, 
just really like taking each day and like living it out. Um, mm. Things like that. And Gail, you want to say the names of any of the, your friends who you're thinking about right now so we can send them some love too? Yeah, so there's Diego Alcala and Moises Alvarez. Mm. Prince, what are, uh, just, just for the sake of what you just said, throw out a couple of their names so that we can all send them some love right now. Oh, so that's uh, Mason Gibbs, Emily Begg. Um, those are a couple um, of my favorites. Um, I've, I've got some of the best memories um, I can ever think of um, with these guys. Do you want to throw out a couple names of some folks you've, uh, that have passed that meant a lot to you that we can send some love to right now? Yeah, um, there's uh, Jessica McNamara. She was one of the first cancer friends I met and unfortunately lost a few years ago. And uh, my friend Luke Quigley Schneider from Chicago, who actually passed away earlier this year. Um, mm. a hilarious guy, and it's tragedy I won't be able to grab a beer and joke with him at the next cancer conference I go to. But mm. it'll be in my thoughts forever. Thank you all so much for being here. And, um, you know, my heart goes out to all of you. Keep fighting and keep spreading the word because you're changing the world one heart at a time. Thank you. Bye, guys.